All right, welcome back in, everybody. This is the Zach Gelb Show, Fox Sports 920, The Jersey. We come to you today from Recovery Sports Grill. We're powered by Corona Light, and uh, we broadcast through the Princeton Orthopedic Associate Studios in time right now back in our Princeton Orthopedic Associate Studios, 416. Three big games coming up, two on Sunday, one on Monday for the local football teams with the Giants, Jets, and Philadelphia Eagles. So nobody better to talk to now than from the Sporting News covers the NFL, and that's Vinny Iyer who's kind enough to join us right now on the Zach Gelb Show. Vinny, appreciate a few minutes, and how are you, my friend? Good. How's it going, Zach? Well, it's going great, and we do appreciate you coming on uh, once again. Let's first start off with this Eagles-Falcons matchup because the one thing that really concerns me in this ball game is how the Eagles are going to defend the bevy of weapons uh, that this Falcons team has, especially with the Eagles being a little bit thin at cornerback this week. So how do the Eagles get after uh, Matt Ryan and try to slow down uh, this really strong offensive attack of the Atlanta Falcons? Yeah, that's the that's the question of the entire game because they you look at the Falcons, they're operating on all cylinders now. They're throwing to everybody, getting everyone involved. You can take away Julio Jones and Matt Ryan is gonna be fine with that because Bob it's new, the tight ends are gonna get open. They're not sure if they're gonna have Tevin Coleman back. I don't see that happening, but you got Devonta Freeman in that running game you got to worry about as well. So good balanced, uh, versatile offense that you have from Atlanta, I think what you're going to see is them use different formations, spread the the team out a little bit, test the Eagles' secondary, which is uh, kind of thin. Um, that's been the weakness in this on this team. So the only difference is they got to get after Matt Ryan. They got to get Fletcher Cox, these guys up front, winning those battles. The Falcons' offensive line that's also been a key to their success with Jake Matthews and Alex Mack. Yeah, this has been an interesting year for the Eagles defense because they've been up and down. We've seen some weeks where they've been so dominant, like that performance against the Steelers, and then we've seen some other weeks where Matt Stafford has picked them apart early uh, in that first half against the Detroit Lions. You mentioned a Fletcher Cox. This is someone that got paid a whole lot of big bucks in the offseason and in the last four games has not been able to produce a sack. You talk about that Falcons offensive line and how it's a big key. Where is the confidence for you that the Eagles can get after the quarterback this week? Well, I think they're going to have to mix things up a little bit. I know they like to be a front four team with Jim Schwartz and all that, but they're going to have to give them different looks and mix it up because, you know, that's what Kyle Shanahan is going to do with formation and all that. They're going to try to throw off the Eagles personnel as much as possible. So they got to counteract that. It's going to be a little bit of battle there between Schwartz and Shanahan, two of the better coordinators in the league. So I'm looking forward to that, but uh, – it's going to be difficult. I think the way that would help is if the offense can get on track. The Falcons' defense is very leaky. They have opportunities here with the Eagles in their passing game. So maybe he can get a lead. That's the best way to get in position to go after Matt Ryan where he's not having the consistent running game to help him. Yeah, it would help if the Eagles' offense could go on some longer drives. And this has been an Eagles' offense that, just like the defense, it's been inconsistent at times this year, but they're struggling more. Uh, as of late and I know this Falcons defense is not that good Uh, they're towards the bottom in the National Football League but I thought we saw a little bit of a blueprint to stop this year's version of the Eagles offense and that's just to blitz them because Carson Wentz uh, he's a very good quarterback I think but he doesn't have a lot of help around him right now so this actually could be a positive week uh, for that Falcons defense and they haven't seen many positive games this year defensively. Yeah, they'll definitely be aggressive, and they have a lot of fast physical guys that are going to fly around here. So they'll, they'll bring those guys in, especially in linebacker and safety, where they have the young guys. So I think that's what you look for in this game. For the Eagles, they're going to use their blitz beaters a lot. Jordan Matthews and Zach Ertz have really good matchups in this game. You look consistently, the slot receivers and the tight ends have really had success against Atlanta. So that's where they have to go. They've got to be prepared to get the ball in those guys' hands. Keep it simple. Obviously, they have a lot of other issues trying to get a consistent wide out to deliver. So you can funnel through Ertz and Matthews, get Sproles into the action, more in the passing game than in the power running game. That's where he belongs. And Sproles can also do some damage in this game against the Falcons. And there's been a big debate uh, over this last week because, you know, Josh Huff was released, and I thought that was the right move. But the Eagles did not fill that roster spot. They went in last week with 52 players instead of 53 uh, they're looking to elevate someone off the practice squad. Paul Turner uh, has been a name that's been mentioned, and he had a really good preseason at wide receiver. And then Aaron Grimes, before he got hurt, 
he's a cornerback. I would have to imagine, though, uh, with the lack of depth at corner this week and also with Leotis and Nolan Carroll uh, not at a full percentage of health uh, when Doug makes that decision, I have to guess that he goes more the cornerback route, correct? Or do you hear something else? No, I think that's the way you have to go because, you, I mean, you look at the weapons, they're not the greatest across the board, but you do have some options at tight end wide receiver now. In this particular game, you need all the secondary help you can get. And this one, because on top of using the tight ends and all that, they started to incorporate a third receiver more into this mix with Taylor Gabriel. So he could be out on the field. Often there was uh, Jones and Sanu. So they're just going to look. With the Falcons, every game you look at it, they're just trying to find the best matchups to exploit him right now. That would be getting as many Eagles corners on the field at the same time. Getting back to that uh, Birds offense led by Carson Wentz, and I thought it was a no-brainer. I actually thought he should have been the number one pick uh, in this year's NFL draft over Jared Groff, who's uh, struggling to find the uh, field right now uh, out in L.A. Uh, but with Wentz, it's tough to evaluate how good he can be just because he doesn't have a whole lot of options around him like we're talking about. But what's impressed you so far uh, this year with Carson Wentz? Because a lot of fans in Philadelphia are definitely feeling encouraged from what they've seen so far. Yeah, he, he does the best with what he has. I wish they would open it up a little bit. They did a little bit thrown downfield, but – I think, to me, the Eagles' offense is kind of predictable with their personnel. and It could be because they have limited personnel. And they can only do so many things with it. But still, I think they could uh, mix it up a little bit, trust Carson Wentz a little bit more. I mean, you look at the numbers, the downfield balls in the air haven't been there for this team, and everyone knows that. And when you can squeeze on a rookie quarterback like that and take away things that he's used to, the easy completions, then it's going to be really difficult. Vinny Iyer with us from the Sporting News on the Zach Gelb Show, Fox Sports 920, the jersey. We go from one rookie quarterback to the other one that I just sort of mentioned that you haven't really seen him on the field at all yet, and that's Jared Goff. We have a Jets-Rams matchup this week. Rams coming off the bye at 3-5. and five. Keenum has been awful this year, nine touchdowns, 11 interceptions. Why haven't the Rams gone to Jared Goff yet? What are you hearing on that end? Well, you have to imagine that Jared Goff just isn't ready, and that's not a good sign. I mean, that, either explanation is not very good, that you, this is week 10 and you don't have your rookie number one overall pick ready to go like he hasn't developed at that point. That's a concern in itself. And then if he is somewhat ready, then why are they sticking with Keenum when they can't learn anything about it? So I think these teams, whether it's Jets or the Rams, uh, certain coaches, whether it's Todd Bowles or Jeff Fisher, they're adamant that their team is still in the playoff race when everyone knows in reality that beyond mathematically alive, they're not really playoff teams, and everyone can see that from the outside. These coaches seem to extend that. To, uh, I, Case Keenum, uh, I think if you throw Jared Goff in this mix, there's also the danger with uh, really getting rattled and messed up because right now there's nothing going on that great in this Rams offense. So you throw a rookie quarterback in there, Maybe they're saying that we don't want to put him in there, have his confidence rattled, and take a step back here in a season that's meaningless as well. So there's two sides to it, but uh, if Goff's not ready, they're not going to put him out there. You know what's also amazing? And we talked about this a little bit more uh, last time you were on the show when we were doing the GM rankings with you uh, in the summer, and we both said that Snead was a very uh, overrated uh, GM and he just gets so much time. Why is there so much loyalty with this Rams organization to Fisher and Snead? I'm not saying they need to make a move in season, but but it's just odd that they have so much commitment uh, to these two guys and they haven't had a lot of success in the National Football League. Well, I think that one thing that probably helped Jeff Fisher and Les Snead was actually the relocation because yeah. in that kind of scenario, you want that stability. Fisher has been involved with a big relocation before, and it's taken a while, like, they're trying to follow the similar pattern there with uh, the Houston Oilers, the Tennessee Titans type move. But that was a different time, different era, different t- different feeling from Jeff Fisher as a head coach. So I, I think maybe they get through this transition, realize they got to blow things up here. When you build that big billion-dollar stadium, almost $2 billion there that's coming up for the Rams, you need results on the field. Right now, the star power isn't there. Todd Gurley has struggled. He's not getting the ball enough either you got to make a big change, and I think it's coming because the expectations are too high to settle for this. Another possible change that may be coming, and I think it would have to be uh, this Jets team not win maybe another game or two for the rest of the season. Uh, But Bowles had a very good year, number one. Year number two has been a disaster 
Uh, how much in danger is Todd Bowles right now in terms of his head coaching position with the New York Jets? Well, I think he just seems overwhelmed. I think as a defensive coordinator, he's great. He was having a great time in Arizona, former player, all that stuff. But he's just having trouble with the organization and the little things as coach, the decisions, the situations, getting people ready to go. That was a concern when you hear things with Sheldon Richardson and Muhammad Wilkerson and the mini mutiny or whatever that's going on. So I think you just have a team and a coach that's a bad fit. You have veteran, aging team, a lot of guys with the big contracts on this team thinking they can win now while in reality they're a team that needs to be blown up and rebuilt. So Todd Bowles probably was in a better situation to be on a team that's already accepted its rebuilding and has the young players. Well, this is just a mix that caught in between rebuilding and and uh, really – contending and we know that they're not really contending i also think his soft-spoken demeanor just doesn't fit uh, in new york especially when he has to overcome some adversity because you know that new york media uh, well uh, me being a part of it could be uh, a little tough to say the least and with Foles, I, I, he's a player's coach I, I think he means well he's a good defensive mind you haven't seen really the defensive results though this year, a lot of it goes to Revis taking a big step back and what I think is Muhammad Wilkerson uh, mailing it in after he got the contract. But you bring up that Wilkerson and Sheldon Richardson debacle. Uh, this is a point where I think that the head coach needs to lay down the law and not just be uh, someone that's a doormat. I, I know you have to decipher that difference between uh, being a doormat and then also a player's coach. I was just surprised that he continues to defend uh, Muhammad Wilkerson. I know he's one of the better players on the Jets, but to say yesterday that he thinks he's one of the leaders of this team, I just think he doesn't need to go there because this is someone that's habitually not showing up to meetings on time. I don't get why he keeps on defending Muhammad Wilkerson. Yeah, it, it's just weird to me. I mean, you know who the leaders are. I mean, you're, you have Brandon Marshall, Matt Forte, those type of guys on offense. Defensively, I think you still look to Revis for – what he can do, I mean, that's probably his biggest asset right now as an aging player on this team. So, yeah, I mean, you have a group of veterans that are the core. I think this team kind of got out of hand at letting those guys age and kind of really going heavy on that side. So when you come out and look at Wilkerson and say things like that, it's going to rub some other players the wrong way that are doing it the right way. Vinny Iyer with us from the Sporting News. Okay, let's get to the last local team uh, that's the Giants playing the Bengals on Monday night. Uh, so you enjoy your football on Sunday, then you get ready uh, for the Monday night game at MetLife Stadium. Break down this Bengals offense for me. Uh, we all know Andy Dalton, A.J. Green. Tell me a little bit more about this Bengals offense. Well, I think in this type of game, with the way the Giants are set up, uh, Jeremy Hill is going to have a tougher time because Damon Harrison is having an outstanding season. He's earning his money crossing over from the Jets to stop the run there. So, I think it's a better game for Gio Bernard, maybe test those linebacks. So he's a slippery running back. You've got to be there to tackle him. You've got to make sure where he is at all times on the field because he can slip out of the backfield, make a guy miss, and go the distance. So I think Bernard is going to be a guy that the Bengals want to get there as much as possible to try to be a game changer here. And Tyler Eifert, you always have to try to get a big body on him somewhere. He's very hard to defend with his size, athleticism. So I think as much as it's nice to go after A.J. Green and try to slow him down, you do have a Janoris Jenkins there. So you can you know, go one-on-one -on -one there. But the guy you have to take out of this game for Andy Dalton is Tyler Eifert. If it takes two guys to do it, so be it. But he can just uh, change the entire landscape of the game. Really, this Giants defense, and I know it's not this great defensive unit. They clearly have their flaws, but they invested – a whole lot of money, and you would think they'd be middle of the pack, and that's where they are right now in the National Football League. Still, though, I have been impressed with the defensive line, no question, but the back end, what Landon Collins has been able to do, Janoris Jenkins, that's the most impressive part to me of this defense this year because Landon Collins, he looks like a whole different player from last year to this year, Vinny. Yeah, he's been outstanding uh, everywhere. With his pedigree, you figured it was going to kick in at some point. I mean, He's a player in that defense in college and coming here. He was going to take over. The instincts are just there. And he, those two guys are going to be pretty critical to this game when you look at the Green and Eifert there. So Collins, I like just moving around. He's got to be the guy that comes up, tackles, slow down, slows down Bernard, doesn't let him slip through, and uh, just finishes on Hill there so he doesn't really get going in the power game. 
Vinny, this offense, though, it's been an enigma to me because they have all the talent to consistently be able to produce high results, but they haven't been producing a lot of those high results. And even last week, it was they, they turned the ball over late. That defense, they set the offense up early for 14 points. What is it going to take for this Giants offense to consistently move the ball forward and, and get this team going uh, week after week offensively? Well, I think the one-dimensional aspect of their offense is always yeah. kind of hold them back, held them back here. So whether it's Paul Perkins, Brian Spark, we saw them, him and uh, Rashad Jennings get equal touches last week. I don't know if Perkins quite yet. I mean, you haven't really seen that burst. You've seen one play there in the passing game against the Vikings several weeks ago that really was special. But other than that, you haven't seen too many great runs by him. So I know part of it is the offensive line issues. They've been banged up and all that. And uh, Justin Pugh doesn't help here. So they're, they're going to have to find some way to get the running game going, take pressure off Eli Manning. Because as much as he's fine with the short passing game and in the ball to Odell Beckham Jr. and Sterling Shepard, you saw that there can be mistakes. When you can tee off on him, put some pressure on him, turn, make him turn over the ball, that's going to happen as long as they don't have any legitimate threat in the running game. Vinny, before we let you run, I just want to bring this uh, point up to you because you have such a good football mind and you know so much about the National Football League covering it uh, for the sporting news. I look at the best wide receivers in the league, my top four, no order, uh, Odell, Antonio Brown, Julio Jones, and A.J. Green. The Eagles see Julio this week. The Giants see A.J. Green. And then, of course, Odell Beckham has a lot of ties here in New Jersey, uh, being a member of the New York football Giants. So those four guys, Odell, Antonio Brown, Julio Jones, and A.J. Green, can you rank them for me one to four? Well, I think it's Antonio Brown because there's just that consistency from him. I think he's easily my number one. I think Julio Jones – is two just because he can do so many things on the field. Sometimes he doesn't get the targets in a lot of places, but talent is right there. And this year, I think Green has been playing off the charts, so I would have to put him third. And Beckham, we know he's right. I mean, these are just minuscule differences, but the way Green has played this year, I think he's a little ahead of Beckham. So Beckham is fourth, but that's fourth of the bullet. I mean, that's a good spot to be with those four guys. Yeah, it's a group, a good group of four. But, Vinny, we appreciate it. Uh, thanks for coming on today, and let's do it again real soon, pal. All right, thank you.